Ah, good evening. Why don't you come in and sit down for a while? Oh, yes, I know talking to an old man like me isn't as exciting as rolling your hoop down Chestnut Street or digging around the stalls on Market and Dock for an apple or two, but it is simply a joy to be back in my adopted hometown, and I'd like someone to share it with. My wife has been dead for over ten years now, and my older son, well, we don't talk much. It would be a delight to rest, to catch up on old news and new events. What's that? Why, yes, Philadelphia has adopted me. I have been happy making my living in this city, and even happier to be able to give so much back to it and its people. Uh, no, I am originally from Boston. My father was a tallow chandler. That's a fellow who makes candles from animal fats. I was the youngest of his fourteen children. In, in fact, my father was the youngest son of his family, and his father, and his father, all the way back for five generations. What do you think of that, eh? <laughs> well, when I was eight, my father sent me to study Latin, with the hope that I would become a minister at Harvard. But after two years, we came to a mutual understanding that I was not meant to be a man of the cloth. And that was all the formal education I ever got. Everything else I've learned, I've had to gather on my own. So my father sent me off to work. Uh, my first master was my older brother, James. Uh, he took me on at the age of twelve, and introduced me to the wonderful world of printing. But for all that, you know, let's just say we didn't always see eye to eye. For five years I worked under him, and then one day in 1723 I ran away to Philadelphia. I loved printing, and soon established myself here, publishing a newspaper, a magazine, and, of course, my famous Poor Richard's Almanac, which ran for 26 years. You may be familiar with some of the sayings I put in it. A penny saved is a penny earned, and God helps them who help themselves. Through hard work and some shrewd business practices, I, I was able to become the official printer for the Pennsylvania Assembly. I married and lived frugally for quite some time, and my successes paid off handsomely. Uh, by the time I retired, at the ripe old age of 42, <laughs> I was earning over 2,000 pounds a year, twice the salary of the colonial governor. That was nearly 40 years ago. But I was not done yet. Oh, I admit that money was nice. But more than money, I have been driven by something greater. Ever since I was a child, I've simply wanted to be better. <laughs> you know, once I even set myself the ambitious task of attaining moral perfection. If I'm forced to admit it, it was a bit of a failure, although I'm sure I came close to being perfectly honest. Then again, humility has never really been my strong suit. Anyway, I, I gave it up and instead devoted myself to helping others. In fact, I have come to believe that the best way to serve God is to serve your fellow man. And I have tried hard, desperately hard throughout all my life, to live out that principle. In 1731, for instance, I helped organize a subscription library company in Philadelphia. And a few years after that, I founded an academy to help all aspiring young men, regardless of their father's income, get an education. You can see the buildings nowadays called the University of Pennsylvania. 
retirement also hasn't stopped me from wondering about this great world in which we live. I'm constantly in awe of the great creator who made it, and am grateful that I should be alive in such a remarkable era. I've also made my own significant contributions to this age of enlightenment, quite literally, with my discoveries about the nature of electricity, how it has a positive and a negative charge, and how it can be stored in a battery. I also invented the lightning rod to help keep people safe from its more dangerous aspects. With both the lightning rod and my famous Franklin stove, uh, yet I never applied for a patent. I just hoped they would provide inexpensive heating and safety from storms for as many households as possible. I, I kept up my, my bent for invention, don't you know? Uh, take a look at these glasses now. Uh, I, I call them bifocals, uh, two different pieces of glass designed to help you see clearly words up close and views from afar off. <laughs> of course, at your age, uh, you don't need these, but maybe someday, when you're as old as I am, you will. <sighs> you know, sometimes it seems like I've only really seen America from afar. It was in 1757, nearly 30 years ago, when I was first sent as a delegate from the Pennsylvania colony over to England to negotiate on their behalf. I had only just returned to Philadelphia in 1775 when the shooting erupted at Lexington and at Concord. After proposing Articles of Confederation to the Continental Congress and serving with four others to draft a Declaration of Independence, I took some time off from national politics to preside over the new state of Pennsylvania's Constitutional Convention. Then, in 1776, right before my 71st birthday, Silas Dean from Connecticut Arthur Lee from Virginia and I went to France, from whence I've only just returned. I brought with me all the experience from my time in London. But more importantly, I took along some fur caps. Boy, those Mademoiselle Shaw took to me, pretending to be a son of the backwoods. <laughs> <laughs> Why, the only time I really went into the wilderness was back in 54, at the Albany Conference during that last great war with the French and Indians. Oh, uh, no, I'm a city boy through and through. Other diplomats came and went, like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, who called me the old conjurer, for the special attraction I held over the French court, <laughs> especially over the ladies. Uh, there was one, Madame Helvetius in particular, whom I positively could not shake. Every opportunity she had, she'd be running her fingers through the fur cap or throwing her arms over my neck. But it was through such winsome charm that I persuaded King Louis the Sixteenth to join our cause. And what a successful relationship that became. Within five years, we had peace and our own country to boot. Do I feel like I've missed out on things by being abroad? Not really. Except perhaps that I find it lamentable that our Congress has chosen a bald eagle for our national animal. I heard the news during our peace negotiations in Paris. Bald eagle. <laughs> well, that bird never gets his living honestly. You may have seen him perched on some dead tree near the river where, too lazy to fish for himself, he watches the labors of the fishing hawk. Now for me, that turkey is, in comparison, a much more respectable bird, and a true, original native of America. <laughs> he is, 
though a little vain and silly, it is true, but not the worse emblem for that, a bird of courage, and would not hesitate to attack a grenadier of the British guards. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to pardon me, but I'm plumb wore out. Age seems to be catching up with me. I'm glad the upcoming convention to revise our Articles of Confederation is going to be held here in Philadelphia. Travel's a bit more difficult for me nowadays. Even now, I'm not sure how my legs will make it over those cobblestones. My, my, it's getting late. And time for bed. As poor Richard put it, early to bed... Early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. Oh, goodbye now. Remember, this is a grand world in which we live. Be curious, explore, experiment, and wonder at your findings. Now, be diligent and work hard considering that human felicity is produced not so much by great pieces of good fortune that seldom happen as by little advantages that occur every day. Above all, in the years you have left, learn to love, to serve others. <laughs> good night. Yeah! <laughs>